Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for Foundations of Behavioral Neuroscience. In this lecture we are going to do a kind of abbreviated sexual and reproductive behaviors. It's still going to be pretty long. So before we get into it we have to differentiate sex and gender. So sex and gender when we're talking about it in here we're referring to sex as biological sex. This is the biological properties that determine male or female. It depends on if you are an XX or an XY. If there is something beyond that, um, like the, the ones we're going to get to in, when we talk about it a little bit later, it's some of the abnormal stuff, uh, like single X or XXY or some of the other um, genetic abnormalities. That is the exception to this, but generally a person is XX or XY, and that is their biological sex. Um, this is what determines the, the, the gonads, the gonadal hormones, uh, the internal and external reproductive structures, and the secondary sex characteristics. Conversely, you have gender. So gender is not directly related to or dependent upon biological sex. Gender is our social and psychological aspects of our gender identity. You can have a gender identity that lines up with your biological sex, but you can also have a gender identity that does not line up with your biological sex. So when we're, we're looking at that, when, we're, when we analyze this, you have to separate the idea of biological sex which biological sex essentially determines your hormones with the exception of abnormalities. Um, but biological sex determines your hormones, your sex characteristics, both internal and external. Gender, on the other hand, is a, a more of a social as well as psychological identity structure. So kind of separate those two. For the most part in this lecture, we are going to be talking about the biological sex. Um, there, I, there's part of your, your chapter that talks about things like homosexuality, going into that more. I have to cut that, unfortunately, from this because this lecture is already going to be pretty long. So when we're talking about biological sex, we have to look at first the gametes. So gametes are the, the sex organs, not the sex organs, the sex cells that are produced by the parents. Um, the, the, the female parent will produce X only. The male parent will produce X or Y. And then you produce, they produce basically one half of what they have. So female is XX, so produces either an X or an X. Male is XY, produces either an X or a Y. If a, the male produces or contributes an X, if, this, if it's an X sperm, then it results in a female offspring because it results in an XX offspring. And again, when we're talking about male and female here, we're talking about biological sex. If the male parent um, provides a Y sperm, if it's a Y sperm that fertilizes the egg, then it results in an XY or a male offspring. Uh, beyond the scope of this class, uh, X sperm are bigger than Y sperm. They live longer, but Y sperm, because they're smaller, swim faster. So in, in the actual sex ratio at conception is 120 males to 100 females. But by age 20, it's 100 to 100. So that's just something to be aware of. So before we get into development itself, I want to point out that there are two different effects that hormones can have on development. The first is in development of the sexual characteristics. The first is an organizational effect. So hormones that have an organizational effect will affect tissue differentiation and development. So basically, they are going to um, have an effect on how the tissues differentiate. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So how we differentiate between male and female. And then there's an act activational effect. And this is after the sexual characteristics have been fully developed and 
um, basically have an effect on activation of sexual behavior. And this may depend on an organism's prior exposure to the organizational effects of hormones. So your testosterone that you've been exposed to earlier in life can have an activational effect later in life after the sexual differentiation is completed. I want to point out, um, I didn't mention it on the first slide, but I'll mention it here. Uh, many of these slides in this lecture, I actually um, recorded for my human sexuality class. So some of the wording, some of the things I may say, I may go into explaining it in ways that we've already talked about in class, various different things like that. I just want to, to point out that um, I, I took basically part of my recorded lecture for human sexuality when I talk about sexual development and input it into this lecture. So if, if some of the wording is weird, that is the result. As far as male and female sexual development, so this is something we're gonna talk about in a bit here, but this is testosterone specifically. So here we're talking about testosterone. Um, the next, for females, we'll talk about estradiol, but testosterone specifically, there is during development, there is a considerably large spike of testosterone in the womb. And this results in um, sexual differentiation. Uh, actually, there's uh, a significant portion of development that has been linked to sexual orientation with testosterone in the womb. If the testosterone is not at the right levels, that can result in differences in sexual orientation. But that being said, all of this, there's a spike. And then at birth, it, testosterone levels out down below. But then in the first few months of life, there's also an activation of testosterone. And this is where you get some differentiation, sexual differentiation during the, the that starts in the first few months of life. But then after about three months of life, it levels out again. Um, and it does not start to spike again until puberty. And one thing that this gets wrong is I would actually put it more like this because testosterone starts to spike again at about seven to eight, but it doesn't go up that high. It just starts to spike at seven to eight and then doesn't have a super spike until what we classically define as puberty. So one thing when we're talking about this, when we're talking about puberty, we have to look at the fact that what we classically define as puberty, uh, so andro arch in males, which is the first ejaculation, um, is, is a sperm arch or andro arch, the first ejaculation, that's actually years after the hormonal changes of puberty start. It's when the hormonal changes of puberty spike, but the hormonal changes of puberty actually start as, as young as six or seven, where we start to have a slight increase in, in the sexual hormones. It doesn't spike though until you're looking at about 11 to 12 range. And then it spikes really high up. Um, and this is where Androarch happens um, in maturation of the reproductive system, all of that. And it, it stays pretty high up here into the, the 20s and the 30s. It, it actually starts to go down after you get into long-term relationships. It goes down when you have children, things like that. And then it declines later in life. There's a reason for that decline, and that is because high testosterone actually is associated with higher risk of cancer. So a reduction in testosterone later in life reduces a male's chance of getting cancer. This is why all those ads out there that are talking about testosterone replacement therapy for older men who have lost their testosterone, um, I wouldn't be surprised if those companies ended up getting sued in the future for the same reason um, tobacco companies have been sued because those comp companies know that tes higher testosterone in life is actually linked to and can cause an increased risk of cancer, yet they're still marketing that as something that, that people should do. The only reason you should get testosterone replacement is if you're down here. 
and then you get it replaced up to the normal levels, not up to levels of up here. In females, um, there is only a slight bump of estradiol during um, fetal development. The reason for the big difference here we'll talk about in just a few minutes, but is the different systems. Um, the, the natural inclination is for female. It actually takes um, the hormonal development to, to shift the natural development to male. So that's why there isn't much in the hormonal regions for females during, um, during the, the pregnancy, during fetal development. Um, and it's flat from early on through birth. And actually, like I said, I would say that it starts doing this. It starts earlier again in girls. These, these early things um, start as early as six or seven even if the classical definition of, um, of puberty in girls is menarche, uh, first period, it, it, the hormonal changes of puberty start years earlier. It just isn't until you get to that age around 10 where it spikes. And then you get menopause that occurs after that. So a continuation from what we talked about earlier, there are three categories of the sex organs, the primary sex characteristics, the internal, the external, let me get those up, the internal, the external, and the gonads. We included the gonads with the internal before, now we're going to kind of separate them out into their own, the gonads being the testes or the ovaries. Um, these um, develop first during early fetal development. Uh, if there is the presence of SRY, which the SRY gene, uh, that's the X and Y gene, the SRY gene, it's on the Y chromosome, um, it results in testes, otherwise it's ovaries. So in natural, without any outside force, ovaries develop. It's with outside force that testes develop. Um, the, the critical period during this is 7 to 12 weeks. Critical period is the period when it's developing the most, when outside forces can have the most impact. So if there's pollutants, teratogens, um, the, the mother's doing drugs, things like that, during seven weeks 7 to 12 is when the, the period of time where this is developing the most is, uh, or they're the most vulnerable to these external forces to then have abnormal development. So, like I said, when the, the gonads become um, either testes or ovaries, depending on the presence of the SRY gene, looking at that in males, in the seventh week, the outer portions of the gonads degenerate and the inner portions develop into the testes. In females, it is the in the eleventh week the inner portions degenerate and the outer portions develop into the ovaries. So when we look at this, um, and we'll come back to this when we look at the the Wolfian system um, and how that works. But basically, what it comes down to is is that in in the presence of the SRY gene, the outer portions of the gonads will degenerate and the inner portions will develop. Without the presence of the SRY gene, the inner portions degenerate and the outer portions develop into the ovaries. So um, when we're looking at the gonads becoming the testes, uh, the, you get this is where um, the, the testes then produce uh, the, the androgen glands. Um, and the androgen glands, the, the different glands that, that are producing the male hormones, the androgens. So the testes and the, the, the endocrine glands that are producing these, are, and specifically the testes, are producing androgens. The testes also release, though, malarian-inhibiting substance. So this is something we'll come back to, but the malarian-inhibiting substance, basically as a result of the SRY gene, causing the outer portions to degenerate and the inner portions to develop 
It then results in malarian inhibiting substance being released. And this malarian inhibiting substance release is what results in most male sexual development. So when we look at this, most changes re reflect the presence or absence of androgen and the presence or absence of malarian inhibiting substance. It's a combination of the two. In females, the, the gonads become the ovaries. The ovaries um, produce um, female hormones. They're the endocrine gland that produces female hormones, specifically androgen, but also um, all of the other ones. There's going to be three or four different ones we're going to look at. The main one, the specific one, being estrogen. You'll notice here that there is no um, substance subsequent or supplemental to it that's released like in the, the, the testes because in the testes it's basically releasing the malarian inhibiting substance because again as I've said a few times and I'll say it again and just coming up in a little bit the natural development is for female it takes external pressure external forces to change the female development into male development so females don't need that extra thing to develop males do so looking at that real quick, um, you get the uh, undifferentiated and the, the undifferentiated results in male differentiation when the, the uh, Wolfian ducks, we'll, we'll use those terms in just a second, the Wolfian ducks are the ones that are, are left, result in the male um, differentiation whereas the malarian ducts are in female differentiation. And when we talked about that, one of the things I said for the hormones that are released by males, one of the hormones that's released is malarian inhibiting substance. That is where it comes into where the, um, the malarian ducts are inhibited. The malarian system is inhibited by the malarian inhibiting hormone. So let's look at the organizational effects then, the a summarization of everything we were talking about. This is bringing it back for um, behavioral neuroscience. So the presence of the Y chromosome leads to male development because the SRY gene leads to the development of the testes. So as we go through here, we have the, the male, we get the um, presence of the SRY gene that essentially leads to the defeminization or the anti-malarian system and the androgen or the masculinization system leading to the Wolfian system. So these, uh, the gonads, the primordial gomads will develop into testes and in, from there the, the rest develops into the penis and the scrotum. Whereas in females, there's none of this effect. You don't get the androgens that cause the masculinizing effect. You don't get the anti-malarian hormone that causes the defeminizing effect, resulting in the female genitalia. And bringing this in more in a uh, way that, that ties it into everything we've been talking about in the class up to this point, we get Basically, the, the central nervous system modulating the androgen functions and hormones, and the, the, it's reciprocal. So then those hormones modulate the central nervous system functions. So it's a um, reciprocal process. And then the central nervous system, it, it's um, basically the hypothalamic, the hypothalamic hormones, the, the ADH, oxytocin, those things we've been talking about. Uh, the hypophysiotropic hormones like GHRH, um, GNRH, uh, gonadotropal releasing hormones, um, these types of things. Then you've got the steroid hormones, the androgens, the estrogens, all of these types that are essentially resulting in all of this. I could go into detail what each of these is doing. Um, the only one I'm going to go into more after this is... Um, Really, I will focus a lot on um, GnRH, uh, the the gonadotropal releasing hormone, um, because that one's one 
that that has a lot of function on the various different systems. So a bit more on the the systems, the internal sex organ precursors. You have that malarian system, which is female. This develops into the the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the vagina. You've got the Wolfian system, which is the male system. This develops into the epidermis, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles. And what these result is, is a, a function of the hormones released by the te testes. Natural effect is to be female. The malarian inhibiting hormone is a, has a defeminizing effect. Testosterone has a mascula, masculinizing effect. So this is where those two differences are going to come in. Um, malarian has a defeminizing effect. Androgens, testosterone mainly, has a masculinizing effect. You can have a mismatch of these where you don't get the defeminizing effect, but you have a masculinizing effect. Or you, don't, you get the defeminizing effect, but you don't get the masculinizing effect. We'll look at some of the disorders later that look at what happens when one of the two of these is prop, appropriate or normal and the other is abnormal. So at seven weeks, we still have external genitalia that's undifferentiated. Pay attention to the colors here, the light blue, the dark blue, the yellow. Pay attention to those as we look at the next two slides, which have sexual differentiation. But you'll notice that there's really no sexual differentiation here. Um, that it's kind of just the the you have some startings of some regions, but it's really just a undifferentiated genital area. By about 11 weeks, you'll start to see the differentiation occurring. So that yellow region we talked about, it's the glands. It, it becomes slightly larger in, in males with the urethral tag inside of it, whereas in females, the urethra, urethral tag will fall down below. Um, those other regions, the, the light blue, the dark blue, the green, they start to differentiate and, and slide to their regions, but we don't have full differentiation by this point. We still have it pretty similar. Whereas at this point, we start to get full differentiation. So that dark blue portion became the, the shaft of the penis. It became the, the body or the pupus in a way of the clitoris, um, the prepuce of the, the male and the prepuce of the female is in the same region. It pulled out there. The green region that was all the way on the outside turns into the scrotum in the male and the outer labia in the female. And then the, the yellow, or not, sorry, the blue region um, ended up becoming the basically a line that is seals it together in the male and it's separated for the female at least until you get to the region below the vagina. So looking at that in pictures, in the 11 to 12 weeks you've got the undifferentiated still but by 19 weeks you've got fully differentiated. So the, the external, it's still undifferentiated at, at about 12 weeks, so it's differentiation starting, but by 19 weeks you get differentiation. In males, at 15 weeks you've got partial differentiation, and by even 16 weeks you get more full differentiation. So it sh shows that that differentiation can actually occur pretty quickly. Let's look a little bit more at the androgen system, mainly testosterone. And this is looking at the, in males, there's a larger, um, basically sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area in the hypothalamus. Basically what happens here is that this results in a greater in release of androgens and it develops into later male sexual behavior. In females, they have a smaller 
um, dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, which ends up making for female sexual behavior being slightly suppressed compared to males. Let's though look at what happens when we have dysfunctions of androgen, androgen specifically. So androgen insensitivity syndrome is the first one we're going to look at. And in this one, it's a genetic mutation that prevents the formation of androgen receptors. So there's the androgen receptors in the neurons don't form. So the androgens don't bind to neurons. Um, so here, the gonads will become testes, which is a normal process. Defemination, defeminization will occur, which is a normal process but you will have lack of masculization. Remember recalling the, the malarian inhibiting substances, the defeminization? Well, um, androgen is masculization. So with androgen and sensitivity syndrome, you still get defeminization, but you don't get masculization. So what you have here is an XY male with female external genitalia. And when I say male and female here, I'm talking about biological sex, not gender. So an XY male that has female external genitalia um, will have a woman's body, but not the internal female sex organs because the defeminization occurred, but the lack of masculization. So masculization did not occur. Here's a couple examples. The left is a mild form. Um, the, the body resembles in some ways male in some ways female uh, kind of a mix of the two biological again uh, the externals look female but there's in, in cases where it's a mild form it's it's not fully there whereas in the one on the right looks fully female it's complete androgen and sensitivity um, the the so the um, external looks completely female however the internal is there is not internal female sex organs. People with androgen insensitivity syndrome tend to be sterile. The next one we'll look at is uh, malarian, persistent malarian duct syndrome. So if um, malarian system being in, in place results in defeminization, a uh, persistent malarian duct syndrome should be the opposite of that, where failure to produce anti-malarian hormone results in um, the, the defeminization does not occur. So in this case, a person will be born with both sets of internal organs because they're developing both the Wolfian and the malarian structures. They've got XY and XY male here, but so they're, and they get typically get androgen release but they don't have the defeminization of the anti-malarian hormone. So the, it, it usually results from a, a problem with the SNRY gene. The next is Turner's. So Turner's sy syndrome is where an individual only has one X chromosome. So will be female or typically female but is essentially going to have a, a lot of other issues here. Um, can result in things like dwarfism, but um, so external development is into female normal, though tends to have uh, a, when it comes to breasts, tends to not have fully developed breasts. Uh, no ovaries, so there's no estrogen being produced. You need two X chromosomes for ovaries. It tends to have a shorter stature, a short web neck. Um, so Turner and people with Turners are, are, as far as I'm aware, always sterile. They cannot have children because they don't develop ovaries. There's no way for them to have children. The next is Kleinfelters. Kleinfelters is similar, but in this case, and similar on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's an XY with an extra X. So you get um, male hypogonadalism where there, there will be atrophy of the testicles. 
leads to infertility. The body hair is distributed like a female, um, tends to have long limbs and narrower shoulders, uh, can have small breasts. When a penis is present, it's small, but it's there. So this is where um, the body is basically trying to develop into both male and female and doesn't fully develop as a result. Okay, let's transition now into um, the, the other parts. Let's look at sexual development, not sexual organ development, sexual development. Sexuality actually begins in the womb. Um, reflective displays of genital arousal, erection in boys um, begins in the womb. Both boys and girls do continue to experience reflex-induced genital arousal throughout infancy and childhood. So genital arousal in infancy and childhood is not abnormal. There isn't sexual thoughts, at least not in the same way. There isn't sexual arousal to, to, um, to external things like images and sounds. It would be more reflex induced where there's um, genital arousal to to touch in different ways. Even before the age of two, egocentrism results. So this is a lack of understanding of others point of view. So during this time, genital exploration is actually a natural part of learning about one's own body. During the earliest stage of development, children um, are exploring the world, they're exploring their body, they're exploring um, their arms, their hands, their feet, and part of that is exploring their own genitals. That is normal. Then after age two, social play begins. This is where genital exploration will expand beyond their own body and curious about curiosity about others. This does though tend to peak at about three to five. This is where your classic stereotypical playing doctor stage occurs. So sexual exploration of games will occur, like touching the self and others, talking about sex, noticing difference between boys and girls, between children and adults. Again, this is normal. This isn't sex itself. This is ex exploration of the world, learning where, where children are learning about themselves and the differences between themselves and others. We're not talking about actual children having sex. We're talking about the sexual exploration games like playing doctor. However, if there's aggressive sexual behaviors, so behaviors where if they're playing doctor, they're not just exploring, they're actually being aggressive about it. This actually may be indicative of abuse and should be investigated. So if the child's being abused, they may act that out on others, including themselves. Um, like I said, sexual, ex sexual exploration games early in infancy and childhood, especially with same-sex playmates, they're normal. It only becomes harmful when, um, when the parent's response to it actually frightens or shames the child. So uh, if the, the child becomes shamed about it or becomes frightened, that can actually internalize um, sexual dysfunction that can result in later issues. What you should do if you catch children at this age um, playing doctor or whatnot, socialize them that privacy is what's important rather than punishing them for the act. Because if you punish them for the act, then like I said, that actually is linked to later deviant behaviors. Um, if you do need to stop the behavior when it's inappropriate, like in public, or if it's going too far, things like that, it's actually better to distract the child rather than scolding or slapping their hands away from them, touching themselves, whatnot. Distract them away from it. Um, distracting is always going to be better than punishing. I hate to make an analogy to, to dogs here, but when you're training dogs, um, it's always best if they're let's say they're chewing on something they shouldn't be chewing on instead of punishing them smacking them hitting them with yelling at them for chewing on what they shouldn't be chewing on because all that teaches them to do is chew on that thing in private or hide it from you if they're if it's shoes they take them to hide now to chew on them yelling at them does that instead of that you distract them from it and eventually they they become aware that the, these other things are more interesting 
the same works for children at this age. D yelling at them only makes them do this more, but in in ways that are deviant rather than um, distracting them away and the behavior will naturally reduce. In the school age years, seven to 11, um, Freud's sexual latency sage is BS, it's not supported. Um, children in, in other cultures begin continue sex play. Um, in our culture, children learn that it should be hidden from adults because of the way we naturally just punish kids who are engaging in sex play. Again, sex play is not sex itself. It's more sexual exploration. By age nine, most social play is with same-sex friends, including sex exploration games. Uh, girls tend to be treated more harshly than boys when caught engaging in sex play, though. So this is where, um, again, the way you react is, is very important. Let's look at puberty. So puberty actually begins, like I said earlier, it begins earlier than most people realize. It begins, at, puberty occurs when the hypothalamus begins secreting gonadotropal releasing hormone, GnRH, and it causes the pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. In males, these hormones stimulate testes to produce sperm and secrete testosterone. In females, they stimulate the ovaries to produce estradiol, estrogens. This begins earlier than what, what you would think. It actually, it's a process. Let's actually look at it on the next slide. It's a process that begins really early in the last several years. So Andrew and Arch begins at about the age of six to eight. And this is where the adrenal glands start to secrete androgen hormone and converts testosterone and estrogen. So this is where um, in both boys and girls, it begins at about six to eight and this process starts occurring. Then several years later, you get gonad arch, gonadal arch. Um, gonad arch is where the pituitary gland releases FSH and LH that we talked about on the previous slide. And the, the testes start to produce sperm and testosterone and the ovaries, ovaries start to release ova and produce estrogen and progesterone. This is though, this is when the secondary sexual characteristics start to occur. This right here is when we classically define as puberty occurring, when gonad arch occurs. However, it actually starts, it's a process that starts many years earlier. So in girls, the first sign of puberty, even before um, uh, first period, is breast buds begin to appear. Uh, on average, they begin at about 11.2 years of age, some earlier, some later. Then the growth spurt occurs at about age 12, goes through about age 16 in most girls. Um, fatty deposits form on the hips and buttocks. This actually causes um, identity issues and appearance issues, though this is normal. Um, pubic hair and after a few years, underarm hair appears. Um, the sweat and sebaceous glands start to appear or start to, to operate. So acne starts to occur. And then at about age 12 to 13, on average, some girls much earlier, some girls much later, menarche occurs. Menarche is first period in girls. So this is again that classical definition of the start of puberty for girls. One thing to point out is the attitudes about menarche vary differ greatly from culture to culture. Some welcome it, some it's a celebration. Some hide it and it's it's something to be embarrassed about. So it's it's really something that that should be considered or thought about when you're talking about the fact that um, this can cause a lot of issues with girls if this is something that that causes shame. So one thing that that I hope you get from this class, one of the main things I hope you get from this class, is when it comes to sex and sexuality. It is important to be open, communicative, and honest. And this includes with children about puberty. And 
when they reach puberty to be open and honest about it so there isn't this these feelings of of dread and fear and all of that that comes with um, certain cultural norms about puberty. And boys, so the first sign of puber puberty is the, the testicular growth. Um, then the, the testicles stimulate the growth of the penis, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicles. Um, growth of pubic hair begins around ages of 11 to 12, finishes about 15. Ejaculation is possible about a year after the penis starts growing. This is where um, where you get spur march, which is the, the, the classical definition of puberty in boys, where ejaculation first occurs. During this time, nocturnal emissions are possible, voice deepening is possible, underarm and facial hair, those sweat and sebaceous glands appear, all of those are in this process. Whenever we talk about puberty, we should talk about precocious or delayed puberty. Precocious is early puberty. This is puberty before the ages of 11 to 12 in girls and before 8 to 9 in boys. Um, it, this is where premature activation of the pituitary hormones due to early weight gain, hormones in meat, milk, chemical pollutants, all of those types of things can cause this to be early. Girls on average are hitting puberty earlier due to the hormones that are in food and in the water and also because of a healthy diet. We'll talk about that in a minute, but a healthy diet actually leads to puberty earlier. Um, there are girls as early as seven to eight hitting puberty. There's some earlier, but those are, are the extreme exceptions. But there's girls as early as seven to eight hitting puberty basically due to this. Conversely, delayed puberty is when the secondary sex characteristics and physical growth do not begin in early adolescence. Typically, this is treatable with gonadotropin releasing hormone and androgens or androgens. Um, so this is something that is treatable if if the child is, has gotten to like 13 or 14 and hasn't reached puberty. You can have doctors check their hormonal levels and possibly get them on hormone replacement. And then with hormone replacement, everything becomes basically normal after that. Nutrition does affect age of puberty, though. This is something that has really changed um, from historical. We, most girls didn't reach puberty, actual puberty, regular, have regular periods until about age of 17 to 18. Now girls are having regular periods as early as 13 to 14 and having first periods much before that. So nutrition does affect age of puberty because um, in, in developing countries, what ends up happening is, is that girls are reaching puberty earlier. Um, though, on the other hand, uh, girls that are thin, so girls with eating disorders, girls that are athletes, things like that, they actually reach puberty later due to the presence of, of leptin. And this actually can adversely affect athletes because athletes who want to grow bigger as they're going through their, their development, um, they can actually, if they're, they're athletes, they can reach puberty later and it keeps them smaller. So if they're playing a sport that they need to be small, gymnastics, things like that, it doesn't adversely affect them. It actually may be a benefit to, to, to do that. But for those who are doing more physical athletics, it's one of those where this is actually harming their development by them being too thin and them not getting enough, uh, enough calories in their diet. Overweight girls reach puberty earlier than average, and healthy girls reach puberty earlier than average as well. So um, health and, and weight are both important. Next, let's talk about sexual behavior before puberty. So pubertal changes in the brain, increased sexual desire. Uh, making sexual risk-taking behaviors more likely. They, so puberty itself leads to an increased sexual desire. This should be self-explanatory. But it's it's one of those when people question why the kids that are 12, 13, 14 are engaging in sex. Well, it's because 
kids are hitting puberty earlier and puberty does cause an increase in sexual desire. These, this increase in sexual desire actually occurs before what we classically define as, as puberty. The first sexual attractions tend to occur at about the age of 10. Um, this is after Andernarch, but before Gonadarch. So after these hormones start being released, but before the spike in hormones. So sexual attractions can occur and um, masturbation at this point in time, even to orgasm, is not uncommon. Even before the age of 10, children can masturbate to orgasm, and they do. Um, I've heard some reports that um, it's becoming regular for both boys and girls to start masturbating at least in part as early as 6 to 7. Um, this is again because that's when that, that those hormones are starting to be released from Andernarch. Sexual attraction, though, that leads to sexual fantasy. Sexual fantasy leads to sexual exploration games like Spin the Bottle. And um, there, there is um, more and more erotic content in early childhood than, than exploration games that do occur. So it's something that is increasing. Uh, especially as diets and all of that change and, and as cultural norms become more accepting and more open, these things will change as well. In other cultures where there, there is different culturing norms, there's different uh, rules and norm, normalities for sexual exploration games. There are some cultures where um, boys in the, the ages, prepubescent boys, in the ages of like 10 to 14 will actually engage in sex with each other um, but then once they get to about 13 to 14 they completely stop doing that it's not classified as homosexuality because it's something that's occurring before full puberty is occurring once puberty occurs it the there is no longer that is no longer occurring so it is again viewed more as a sexual exploration game than sex itself. And that, again, it all depends on the sex, the norms of the culture, the sexual norms of the culture. We are a more closed culture, so our norms are to be more, to have it more hidden, so there is less known in our culture than in other cultures. So, as the, the secondary sex characteristics after the onset of puberty occur in females, estradiol causes an enlarging of the breasts, the growth of the lining of the uterus, a widening of the hips, a maturation of the genitalia. Androgens also affect females. This is where you get underarm and pubic hair, the face as well. Most girls have facial hair as well. It's just not as prominent as it is with males. It's actually very common for females, most girls have facial hair. Girls that, that are blonde, it's it, it's not as pre as noticeable. But girls with, that are have darker colored hairs, it becomes more noticeable. Males androgens um, cause facial underarm and pubic hair, deepening of voice, altering of hairline, muscle development, and maturation of the genitalia. And males also have estradiol, which can cause an enlarging of the breast. Too much estradiol, too much estrogens, like in the water or in foods, can actually cause enlarged breasts in males. This is why males who are overweight tend to have enlarged breasts, because in the fat cells, estrogen gets stored, and that is then released into the system and causes an enlarging of the breasts. Specific to male androgens, um, it's again synthesized and secreted by the cells of the testes. It's controlled by the FSH and the ICSH, the intracellular stimulating hormone. And again, like I said, it, it develops the secondary sex characteristics um, and initiates spermatogenesis. Uh, we already talked about all of that, so this is already a long lecture. I'm just moving through it pretty fast. The point I bring this back up is testosterone has adverse effects. The adverse effects is if there's too much testosterone in young boys before puberty, it can actually impair bone growth. However, in later adulthood, 
it increases the risk of cancer. I talked about this a little bit ago, but I just want to reiterate this. The risk of cancer increases dr drastically with increased levels of testosterone in later adulthood. Uh, it, anytime you see that, that um, testosterone replacement therapy, um, drugs, the ads for that, just be aware that, that they are using um, persuasion tactics on you to basically say that you're less of a man because your testosterone went down. That is not true. You, all you're doing by doing the testosterone replacement is increasing your chance of dying young. Estrogen and progesterone, again, they regulate the development and the maintenance of the female reproductive system and the secondary sex characteristics. And cycling of FSH and estrogen influences the female menstrual cycle, which we'll talk about in just a minute. The adverse effects of estrogen, though, involve a whole bunch of things. Nausea, vomiting, breast swelling, fluid retention, weight gain, um, high blood pressure, breast cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer. Why is this important? Well, estrogen is normal at certain levels. However, it should be very much pointed out that estrogen is in birth control. Estrogen and progesterone are the two components of birth control. It is why all of these things on this slide are actually side effects of being on birth control, especially if you're on birth control too long. So that's something to consider when you're on hormonal birth control. Hormonal birth control actually has these as side effects. So you should not remain on hormonal birth control that long. They say 10 years is the most you should be on it. Progesterone. Um, this is secreted um, the last two weeks of the menstrual, menstrual cycle. Um, it's where the uterine lining begins the secretory phase. It's where the uterine lining starts to where the, the, the menstruation begins. Um, it's essential for maintenance and integrity of the plate, placenta and embryo. It basically um, is part of the process of menstruation. However, there's adverse side effects like nausea, fever, weight gain, headaches, dizziness, and diminished sex drive. Again, hormonal birth control also contains progesterone. So it has these side effects. So let's look at the, the female cycle. So uh, at puberty, the female reproductive system matures. Menarche is the first menstrual period. It, it occurs between 9 and 17, but typically around the age of 12 now. Ovulation is the phase of the menstrual cycle at which the ovarian wall, ovarian wall ruptures and releases a mature egg. So ovulation is where an egg is released into the fallopian tubes. Um, and it, it floats around in the fallopian tubes for only about two to three days. It does not last that long. But throughout the cycle, you have the menstrual cycle where there's three phases. We're not going to count the ovulatory phase as a phase. Ovulatory phase is not a phase. doesn't make sense, but the ovulatory phase is not a phase. You've got the follicular phase. This is the, the phase prior to ovulation after menstruation. This tends to last about uh, four days. Um, then you've got ovulation that occurs. Then you've got the luteal phase um, that, that occurs after ovulation. This lasts about two weeks. And then you've got the menstrual phase that, that lasts about a week, five days. Um, so the follicular phase can be up to a week, sometimes less. The menstrual phase can be up to a week. The secretory phase is uh, the luteal phase is about two weeks. Um, and yeah, let's look at the next couple slides looking at what goes on here. So the hormonal control of the reproductive cycle, this is a bit more beyond the scope of the class, but I did want to put it here. First, you begin with the secretion of SHH to stimulate growth of the ovary follicles. Um, then the ovary and follicles mature and uh, causing the growth of the lining of the uterus, increasing the levels of estradiol, triggers the release of luteinizing hormone, causing ovulation, the release of the egg. The 
egg enters the fallopian tube and starts migrating towards the uterus. It meets the sperm and becomes fertilized and, and begins to divide, then attaches to the uterine wall. And if it's not fertilized, the ruptured ovarian follicle and the lining of the uterine wall are expelled when menstruation commences. So it's a cycle that looks like this. You've got the menstrual phase, the proliferate phase that's leading up to ovulation. The ovulation is in there. Then the secretory phase where it's basically going back to the menstrual phase where the body is detecting to see if it is um, if the egg has embedded itself on the uterine wall or not. As far as the hormones, so progesterone is in blue, as you can see. Um, so you've got the, the proliferate phase. You've got this spike right here. This spike right here is about where ovulation is. So progesterone spikes up when ovulation occurs. Um, estrogen spikes just before ovulation. Uh, luteinizing hormone spikes at, at ovulation, whereas FS, FSH spike during the secretory phase. This period of time right here when uh, uh, the FSH and estrogen is now spiking again or going up again is basically where where it's telling the body okay the it implanted on the uterine wall or it didn't implant on the uterine wall and if it didn't then you get menstruation a couple different things that can happen during the menstrual cycle first is this menorrhea this is mild or severe discomfort during menstruation um, where you get pelvic cramps, nausea, headaches, backaches, bloating. This is the, again, mild or severe, but this isn't a regular or a normal thing. It's basically dysmenorrhea is a intermittent mild to severe pain. Um, it, that's differentiating from the next thing we're going to be talking about, which is a regularly occurring Whereas this is an intermittent, it doesn't make it any less severe when it occurs, but it's intermittent, so it's not considered necessarily a disorder. Whereas premenstrual syndrome, PMS, is, and it's symptoms that affect many women during the four to six days prior to menstruation each month. So this is where, where there is a strong combination of physical and, and psychological conditions like anxiety, depression, irritability, weight gain, abdominal pain, and whereas dysmenorrhea happens during menstruation, uh, PMS happens in the days prior to and can be much more severe, much more regular, and, and much more debilitating. Since this always is a question that comes up, not during this class, but in general, uh, what about sex during menstruation? There's actually no evidence that sex during menstruation is physically harmful to either the male or the female. Uh, many people do continue to engage in sex while, while others abstain. Um, actually, one of the positive benefits that's been found is, is it could can be, in certain cases, helpful in relieving cramps by dispelling blood congestion. So if it's something that, that you and your partner are willing to do, it, just be aware that there's no negative side effects there may even be benefits but it's not something that that you have to do so but work it out with your partner let's talk about contraception let's talk about oral contraceptive specifically so for females oral contra contraceptives typically are hormonal contraceptives that prevent conception they tend to be a combination of estrogen and progesterone, and they, they are designed to basically prevent either ovulation from occurring or prevent implantation of, on, of the uterine wall of the egg from occurring. Now, the adverse effects of these 
again, those adverse effects that we talked about for estrogen and progesterone, nausea, acne, headaches, breast swelling, weight gain, fatigue, depression. So it shows that um, the, the oral contraceptives, when we're talking in the domain of hormonal contraceptives, can have some pretty adverse side effects. Um, there are other options out there. Actually, there's an option that, that they've been working on for a while. It hasn't been approved in the U.S., but it is approved in India. And that is where males are, are injected with a fluid into the vas deferens of the testes. Um, and basically what occurs is, is it breaks up sperm that's going through it. It's something that's injected in there. It's relatively painless. It's an outpatient procedure. And for it, it basically makes the male sterile for 10 years for when it comes to sperm. All the other hormones are still there, so it has no negative side effects. It just breaks up the sperm and causes the sperm to, to die as it's being ejaculated. Um, it's also something that can be reversed with another injection. And like I said, it tends to last about 10 years. So there is other th options out there other than these hormonal options. It's just we're, we're slowly moving in that direction, definitely not fast enough. In males, there's anabolic agents, uh, which is our adrenogenic steroid hormones or androgens, such as synthetic testosterone. When used properly, they can promote muscle growth and... Um, and when used properly, they, they, they do help with those who have androgen deficiencies. However, they tend to be misused by athletes, and they can have very serious side effects, such as liver toxicity, um, testicular hypofunction. Hypo means reduced, so reduced function of the testicles, elevated cholesterol, cancers, erectile dysfunction. Um, all of these are things that can result from abuse of steroids. Again, I do not recommend them unless you're unless you're advised by a doctor, because the the side effects far outweigh the advantages, the gains. In women, they reach menopause. Um, it typically starting at about 40, maybe as late as 60. It's a range. But menopause is the permanent cessation of the menstru menstrual cycle. Um, many women do get hormone replacement therapy. However, again, just like I said before, I don't recommend hormone replacement therapy just because we our bodies do these hormonal changes for a reason. There's actually no um, um, strict proof that hormone replacement therapy actually does anything. The, the Women's Health Initiative actually cast out on the benefits of hormone replacement therapy. Um, it's believed to, to reduce hot flashes and things like that, but all it really does is delay them. It doesn't reduce them in the long run. On average, menopause occurs at about the age of 51, and really what this results in is a drastic decrease in estrogen levels um, because androgen levels don't change, testosterone levels don't change, there can actually be a, a period of time where, where women become more masculine during this time because there's a drop in estrogen, but the androgens stay the same. The last thing I want to talk about is reproductive cancers. So both uh, males and females have reproductive cancers, males have testicular cancer, females have um, ovarian cancers and cervical cancers. Uh, males, the, the testicular cancers are actually highly related to androgens. Too much androgen that's actually released by the testes can increase your rate of testicular cancer. Conversely, Males who with testicular cancer actually tend to be treated with estrogen in order to reduce that. And it is an effective treatment. It's not 100% effective, but it is an effective treatment at, at helping eliminate um, male cancers, male reproductive cancers. Females, on the other hand, ovarian cancer tends to be with too much estrogen, 
they're actually treated with the male hormone testosterone. So males are treated with estrogen when they have reproductive cancers. Females with reproductive cancers are treated with testosterone. Just some interesting stuff there. So that's all I got for you. Uh, it didn't end up being as long of a lecture as I expected, but at the same time, it's it's a full class lecture, so I, I have to keep it at that. And that's why I drop some of the things like uh, homosexuality. If you want to talk about that, you can come to me and talk about that. We can talk or send me an email. Uh, we can have uh, a Zoom meeting about it and talk about it. Um, but it's there's some really interesting stuff there that unfortunately I had to cut in how um, genetics and hormones affect sexual orientation and um, gender identity and all of those types of things. I uh, could talk about the 2D, 4D ratio and look at how hormones affect that and how that's relating to it. But we'll, we'll leave it at this. We looked at hormones and development. We looked at it in pretty good detail. And um, we will move on to, to the next topic from here. Thanks. Come on back.